Hey, hello. <laughs> hey everyone, forgot to unmute uh, myself there. But it seems like we are live. Uh, let me check. Say hi into the chat if you are online and uh, watching. That would be nice to, to know that I'm not alone here. And just as I check a bunch of uh, small details, uh, we can just start. Uh, today I want to write some Cypress tests, uh, debug them, talk about best practices as I often do. Uh, hopefully it will be fun. Uh, if you feel like it's not fun, post a question. We can just we can always change the topic. We can always uh, talk about something else. Uh, but uh, yeah, what I like to do is to do live coding, do do testing, and if that's something you enjoy, uh, feel free to stay, uh, post some questions, and hopefully we'll have a good time. Um, all right, say hi in the chat. I'll just quickly check some stuff. Uh, we're multi-streaming today uh, to multiple platforms, so hopefully uh, we can see what's going on in every platform, and hopefully you can chat from every platform. That's the tricky part. Uh, and I have been stream have been streaming streaming for a long time, so there's still a bunch of details that I need to sort of iron out and maybe check during the stream because I'm never confident everything is uh, everything is working. So just uh, just give me a second and say hi in the chat. All right, uh, seems we're on a good track. Hey, Lee, focus, focus. All right, <laughs> we are focused now. Uh, great, seems we are on uh, on the right track. So hopefully everything is fine on the technical side uh, and on the on the chat side. Hopefully everything is fine as well. If you're unsure, if you feel like I'm not reading your message or it doesn't even like appear, it should appear right, like right here next to my face. If you don't see that appearing, and you don't see the chat appearing anywhere, then uh, you can hop over to YouTube. I'm currently streaming live both on Replay.io, YouTube and on uh, testing tips by Philip Hitz, so uh, you can probably reach out to me there. And if I'm not listening, uh, then scream. I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm not. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's do some testing. Uh, I have been uh, working a lot on a, a replay IO course where I explain uh, how to use replay IO, and I'm going to be publishing first lessons hopefully next week, maybe even. Maybe even this week on Friday, we'll see how how that goes. Uh, but uh, I have been doing lots of lots of testing, lots of trying uh, with uh, with replay. And uh, if you have missed this, I have done a live stream also yesterday. So I was live yesterday, and I'm live today. But yesterday I was on Nikolai Advolotkin's uh, uh, YouTube channel and all his social networks. And what we were doing was that we were uh re creating uh replays which replay io on a java framework so we used selenium uh which was uh, tests which were tests written by java and then we set up uh that to work with replay uh replay browser and it was awesome so uh, so build feel free to check it out we were struggling a bit uh, it wasn't smooth sailing but once we figured it out it was it was smooth sailing from uh from there so uh today i thought uh, maybe we can revisit the project because i have been i have seen that there's a uh, there's a sauce labs uh demo project i believe it was sauce labs demo.com Maybe not. Well, we can we can search source labs demo. No, okay. Let's do source labs demo. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Swag labs. Yeah, that's that's the app. And is this the app? No way. That's uh, this looks a little bit different, but the idea is very similar. There is a login page where you can put in your username and password and those are available right on this page so you can 
you can test the successful login or the unsuccessful unsuc login. And uh, then you log in. Well, let's do that. And you should see a swag store. Yeah, like an e-commerce site where you can add stuff to the cart and maybe look at the details. Uh, uh, pretty basic stuff, but it's really nice for for situations where you want to uh, where you want to uh, test your uh, test automation skills. Maybe you want to automate this with a new framework you're learning, and here's something you can you can test against. So it is a really nice project. It's actually it looks slightly different than the one that we were uh, working on with Nikolai yesterday. So let me let me see if I can. If I can find the right one, uh, it was interesting. We did take a deep dive into the project. We did take a look at the at the items uh, and the React components that the application is uh, is created from, um, and it was it was a lot of fun. But uh, I can't seem to find the right version. You know what? Let me let me. Let me take a look in here because I believe I have the link to that to that project somewhere here. All right, here we go. And now can now I can take a take a look. So we created this recording, believe it or not, with Selenium Java, uh, or yeah, with Selenium in, in Java, and as we passed the replay browser instead of standard Chromium browser, we were able to capture everything that the Selenium script uh, was doing. So we all open, opened the sauce demo. I believe that was the site, right? Sauce demo.com. Oh wait, there's like a V1. So maybe if I don't do V1. Okay, here's the version two. Okay, okay, okay. Now I understand what's going on. It was looking differently, so I wasn't sure what's, what the hell is going on. Uh, all right, so this is this was the application we were testing today, and we created that recording. So we had a Selenium script, we hooked up Replay Browser into it, and we recorded basically everything that the script was doing. So the script would open the site, it would type in the email or the username, and then password, it would click on the submit button or submit the submit the form and that was pretty much it so as we created that recording what we could do next was to dive into the uh, components and uh, and different parts of this application so this application is written in react this swag labs we could see all of the static assets we could see everything that was happening and we were adding these print statements to sort of examine what's happening in the application. So that was that was pretty cool. We didn't really have a flaky test or a failing test, or so there was nothing to investigate. And that's where the power of replay really lays. Um, but it was still still kind of cool to see. For example, like here you can see this typing password. So we could uh, jump into the function this handle pass change, which was handling the uh, the uh, the, the, all the keystrokes that were that were uh, entered into this password input field, right? So as we were typing, all of those keystrokes would be registered, and on the application side, everything is handled by this function. So we printed out like the even target value of whatever uh, whatever keystroke was uh, done, and that's created this sort of sort of pyramid of all of the all of the values that at each point the input field had so yeah yo yo is asking me how do you end to end test uh, how do you end to end automated api testing oh that's a good question um i never really ha had a situation where i only was uh uh responsible for api testing for like just API testing, it was always end-to-end -end testing and the APIs were part of that or, or whatever. Uh, but um, you know me, I'm a, I'm a Cypress ambassador, so I did uh, a lot of testing in, in Cypress. And as a part of that, I've created this plugin 
Uh, that's basically a Cypress plugin allowing you to make your API testing a little bit easier. So, oh, it's doing pretty well. We got 18,000 weekly downloads, although I haven't made an update uh, for some time. Actually, nine months ago, was it? Oof. I need to I need to get back back to work on on this one. It's a really nice plugin. Basically, it wasn't really an original idea. Uh, Gleb Bahmutov has made something very similar. All the the UI was not as uh, fancy, and it didn't show all of the information this plugin uh, shows. It showed some different information. But basically, what it does, it adds a new command to your Cypress library called CY API. And you can have like this postman like experience where you can take a look at the query and headers and respawns and 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 size and duration and all of the attributes of, of API testing. So it was good for some it, it is a good plugin for something uh, that um, that requires you to like call some API endpoints and then examine maybe make some assertions on on them and you don't have to like open the console, it will just appear. Uh, in the UI view of Cypress. Now, you're saying end-to-end -end automated API testing. So if you're saying, if you're using the phrase end-to-end -end and API testing in one sentence, well, what I'm imagining is that you're trying to think of uh, like an end-to-end test uh, where you would have like multiple API calls that were connected to each other, right? So something like create a new user, then create a subscription for that user or buy an item or whatever, basically multiple API actions that sort of create this nice, nice flow. Um, in Cypress, this is kind of hard to do because what Cypress does, uh, let, me, let me create a new project. Uh, do, do, do. Give me a second, new window, here we go. Uh, what Cypress does, and should I create a new project? Actually, let me just create a new file, uh, right? And say this is a Cypress test. Okay, so I'm writing some Cypress commands like CMY request, and I'm calling certain API. Let's say it's a post request to uh, I don't know, account create, and then we pass on some objects, right? Like username, mm, hello, hello, and then password, and it will be something like this. I don't know, right? So when we send this request, we get a response. And typically in Cypress, what you need to do is to create a chain of commands. So when you want to use information from this request, what you need to do is to use a then function, right? And then you get some like, okay, account create. And let's say that this account create has some interesting information like, I don't know, user ID, right? User ID or maybe just account ID, right? And it's located in account create body uh, account ID, right? Something like that. So now you want to make a request with that account ID. So what you need to do is to do CY request. And then I don't know, I guess post again. And then subscription. Subscription. And then in the body, you will set the, I don't know, like you'll do the body, uh, no, um, account ID, which will be account ID, right? You need to reuse the information you have gathered with the, with the first request. So, and you use that in the second, right? And, and then when you want to use information from the, this request, again, you go then, and the story goes on, right? And some people call this callback hell because you like create multiple levels of nesting with each and every command, right? Um, with each and every request. There are multiple ways of how to get around that, but there, n none of them are like too elegant. 
and uh, you can sort of flatten this out but you would still have at least one level of this then uh, function which is not the worst thing but it makes the API flow and understanding of like the whole end-to-end -end flow a little bit more mm, janky so uh, that's why maybe Cypress, I mean, it works really well. And if you're using it for end-to-end -end testing and you want to add API tests, by all means, go for it. If you are just focusing on like doing API testing only, if that's your only mission, that's your project that you want to do, uh, I would maybe recommend some, some other tools which are like designed around the, having a really good API experience. The plugin that I have made, is supposed to make that experience a little better, but you will still need to deal with this. Um, tools like Postman, Insomnia, maybe some other tools might be a little bit more elegant uh, and easier to work with. Um, I've worked with Postman, I never find it, found it that elegant, but I could see myself setting up a certain flow that could work well. So that's, that's kind of my take on the API testing. Oh. Uh, Carl, Ka sorry, Kagri, Kagri, uh, I'm probably not pronouncing your name right, sorry about that, but Kagri is asking, what is your shift left test understanding from a QA perspective? Uh, I don't know, um, shift left, uh, the shift left has become sort of a buzzword, and I, I feel like I've been to many conferences where speakers would use the shift left reference, and it would like generally mean one thing, but everyone had sort of their own flavor and it sort of uh, uh, blurred what the meaning of this phrase really is. So I'm not really 100% sure uh, what you are asking. If, if I'm going to take like a broader uh, perspective or broader interpretation of what this term is, then it is about moving testing uh, to the left, which like if you imagine, a, I, I, I'm assuming that this idea sort of sparked uh, around a Jira board or, or something like that. We want to shift left to where the development is, right? We want to be in the early stages. We want to start testing early, uh, begin testing when the feature is not complete or, or be a, a advocate of quality even when the uh, feature is designed start planning early, maybe do some um, test-driven uh, development even. And all of these different ideas uh, are usually referenced to as shift left. Um, I think in general, it's good that we have these conversations on, uh, on uh, conferences and events and blog posts, etc. cetera. Um, what I would maybe say uh, uh, about this is that, that my personal opinion is that every tester should get technical and I feel like shifting left, uh, getting technical and shifting left are very much like overlaying, right? If we want to be uh, involved as testers in the development planning and maybe design process, we need to understand uh, these things. And I think generally that's a good thing. I'm very big proponent of, hey, if you're testing, Try to understand what the technical solution is. I think that's really good for you. I know not everyone has this opinion. Some people are are trying to stay more on the business side and don't really want to think about what's what's inside the black box, right? So they do the black box approach. Um, I'm not really a fan of that. I, I believe testers should get technical. So I think the conversation about shift left is a useful one. And... and uh, yeah, I think QA testers want to be involved in that. Um, I'm going to be talking about this in, uh, at one of the conferences I'm, uh, I'm going to. I have like this working metaphor um, that I don't know if it works well or not. Basically, if you have some technical solution, like a real world technical solution, for example, like an airplane, right? If you want to be sure that the airplane does the thing that it should, which is fly, transport people or goods, or basically work from beginning to the end, you don't really want people that don't understand the technicalities testing it, right? 
if you want someone to assess whether this plane is working and is actually going to uh, work uh, well throughout its lifetime, you probably want to uh, have that assessment made by someone who understands how planes are built, how they are assembled together, right? You could look at the business side and you can say that, all right, we have these ni really nice leather seats inside and and uh, everyone's going to be having a great time when, when, it, when they're using the plane, but maybe the plane never takes off, right? Um, so I think this this sort of, I see sometimes, I see this sometimes being reflected in the like a testing and QA uh, discussions and, and there's apparently dilemma on whether you should or should not be technical. I personally always say be technical, try to understand, try to under, be able to read the code. You don't have to be developer, but at least have an idea of what the building blocks are. Uh, and again, I say this as my own opinion. I'm not saying that this is the whole truth. I'm still learning a lot, so I don't think um, I'm, I'm covering like all the areas here. So I come from sort of a web dev uh, world where I'm dealing mostly with like web uh, applications. So that's just so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, yeah, and we got we got some clarification on that. Increasing unit test number with different scenarios and reduced UI test. Does it really work? That's what I'm wondering. And see, this is <laughs> this is the thing I was kind of wondering. Like, what does it mean shift left? Because I heard this as well. It I, I didn't uh, think of of uh, uh, of mentioning it because this is also part of the the, the shift left. Uh, uh, perspective, right? Let's let's start testing at the, at the unit level and let's reduce the, the UI test. Um, I don't know if I have like a very set opinion on this. Um, I've been, um, I mentioned Nikolai Advolotkin, uh, I have been on his podcast uh, for a second time. The second uh, episode is not yet published and I said something, <laughs> he, he gave me a really good question. And he asked me, like, do we need testers? And uh, I, I said to Nikolai, oh, I'm going to get cancelled for this. Uh, but I don't think we need testers, we need testing. Uh, and then I explained my position, which I'm going to do now. Uh, but also I was kind of laughing that someone is going to clip that and, and just drag me all over the internet. Uh, but what that means is I like to be really pragmatic about about testing and about uh, what we do because our clients don't really care about whether we write our test in Cypress, Playwright, Selenium, whatever, uh, but they care about working product. And if you think critically about what your product needs and what it is you need to do in order to make it uh, uh, to make it be functional, right? To, to, to make it work the thing that it is supposed to be doing. Uh, if the answer is more unit tests and less UI tests or no UI tests at all, then by all means, go for it, right? If the answer is, hey, let's actually make more UI tests and we don't really need unit tests because our, uh, our, our components are not doing this sort of complicated thing so we can pretty much live without them, uh, then by all means, right? Some applications needs API, need API testing. If you have an application that has a lot of integrations, then you probably need some contract testing. That's why we have all of these different types of testing, right? Uh, because not every application is the same and every application probably needs some, some, different, um, um, some different approach. Um, so that, that's a lot of words for like not really, really saying anything. Uh, because honestly, I don't really have a set opinion on this because I would probably form that based on the context of, of the application that I'm that I'm testing. Um, and it's really very different to test a SaaS service versus like an e-commerce store or a CRM or something else. You, you're going to have like a bunch of different problems in every one of these applications. Um, so, so hopefully I'd at least, uh, at least partially <laughs> answers, uh, answers the question. Uh, all right. Thanks for those questions. Keep them coming. Um, I wanted to do one thing. Uh, yeah. So I, I looked into the, 
uh, Swag Labs looked into into replay and the way of how we can uh, um, examine what's what's going on in our application. There was one interesting thing that happened yesterday. Uh, we'd have this credentials JS file, and when we ooh, our apology, something went wrong. Let's try that again. Uh, yeah, and when we were trying to, there was this set credentials functions, and we when we tried to um, print out the username and password, what would happen is that we would have uh, standard user and undefined. The password would just like disappear at some point, and I was trying to find out like where that happens because we first looked at the login. Uh, component we see the, the, the password there was this uh, verify credentials function which would verify the credentials and then there would be set credentials and I would add a print statement right below this right right where the where we have the the set credentials and that's the orange orange print uh, statement right and we could see the standard user secret sauce right but then when I would go to the function itself and try to print out the, the the variables it would say undefined and I and I didn't know like why uh, why that is happening so that's that's something we we were trying to get uh, get to the bottom but uh, we were like over two and a half hours at that time so we didn't get to that uh, might be might be fun to uh, fun to explore but uh, maybe it's too like sort of in the in the middle. Uh, what I thought of doing uh, today is to go to GitHub, confirm your account. Yeah, okay, let's let's go there. Uh, I was just randomly trying to search for for Cypress tests in uh, different repos that are like open source and out there on uh, on GitHub. And try to see, um, try to see some Cypress tests. Maybe clone them. Try to run them, uh, and and debug them. Maybe maybe learn something, something interesting. So we have uh, some repositories. Let me make this bigger. This is some Cypress playground. All right, we got the DB setup running the test. This looks interesting. Steve Kinney. And Petro Zubar. Um, let's see what kind of tests we have here. Oh, there's, these are lessons. So this seems to be like a like a workshop. There you go. Really nice. Really nice stuff. Additional things you can do. Aliases. Oh, this is this is really good. Shout out to Steve Kinney and collaborators because this seems like a really nice workshop or something all right okay yeah so in this workshop they go through like all kinds of different different things i'm wondering what what sort of application they are using because i see that there's a there's a setup let's do cypress json localhost 3000 all right so let's see what we are starting oh prisma nice okay so there's there's like a serious application here with the database uh prisma seed npm run dev open what does svelte kit dev oh okay so there's like a Svelte application that you can test within this repo. This looks nice. Uh, it is a little bit outdated because I see the version of Cypress is an older one. What version do we have here? 9.1. And then we have a bunch of tests here. Okay. All right, I'm thinking this is a workshop, so this would not be like a set of tests that we could uh, simply run. So maybe let's go back to search and find some some other project. 
here. Sarania, hi. Uh, sorry, I saw your message earlier, but I didn't respond. Uh, okay. File opener, where are we? Let's go. Let's go way back. Okay, repository. Cypress. I, I saw some... Some Cypress... Uh, it was like an interview question, like a re repository for, for an interview, uh, find a flaky test or something like that. Uh, and GX Cypress tests, JS calculator, okay, project Cypress. <laughs> Cypress testing. What did I search for? I forgot what I what I searched for when I when I was looking for for the repository because I know I found a Oh, this is a lot, okay. Repository contains code Cypress. Let's do maybe Cypress flaky. Just sort of doing a, a full text search on the on GitHub. Flaky test Cypress. That sounds promising. I think I yeah. Flaky test challenge. As an engineer, you will be expected to ensure that all new features and fixes do not cause regressions or headaches for active users. Tests are an important tool. Blah blah blah. The challenge. Okay. Test. The test for this app sometimes passes and sometimes fails. You should be able to quickly figure out a change that will make the test 100% reliable. You may modify any file or files except those in SRC directory. That sounds like fun. I really like that this, this is the interview question or interview challenge. I think that looks good. All right. It seems that this has not been updated for a while. Uh, but I'm going to I'm going to clone it anyway, try to install it, and then we'll see. Maybe we'll update the uh, maybe we'll update the Cypress package. Maybe not. So let's open terminal. Let's do git clone. Oops, what did I do? Terminal. Like test Cypress. Let's open that. Code flaky. Let's zoom this in and do npm install. All right. So let's see if I can figure out whether the why the test is flaky just by looking at the test. I guess that's probably the the challenge, right? Oh, there are a lot of tests. Oh, okay, interesting. Oh, yeah, a great idea. Sorry about that. Yeah, send a repo, repo URL. Lucas, thank you for for reminding me. I just sent it. It seems like I sent it <laughs> like everywhere. Uh, hopefully, if I found the found the repo. Um, all right, let's go back to the test. So there are a lot of tests. So I'm thinking I'm going to run them oh wait it's a single test but it has a couple of couple of things running in it so how do i what do i open i open the base url so what's the base url localhost 3000 so i guess i need to run yeah start okay let's do npm start so this should start something it did that's good Look, here we have the application. Let me just center it so we can see that. Okay, so there's the application. We got like a sign up sheet. We can add email, password. Oh, that's invalid email. How about this one? That works. Which department? Which course? Oh, nice. We have like dynamic loading. It's saving something, probably sending my information somewhere. Oh, and here we have a 
here we have the output. All right, so that's how the application works. Now let's go ahead and do npx cypress open. Oh, we're running version point version seven. Oh, that's ancient. Oh, okay. I'll probably just update it. Uh, will this even run? I'm wondering how how long uh, how long does Cypress maintain uh, their version? Oh, and it's slow. <laughs> I forgot how slow it is, because Cypress has made some updates, you know, like to for like M1 MacBooks, and it was like super fast. So now I click this oh it doesn't even open chrome for me something seriously broken with this version <laughs> all right let's let's just update it i cannot even look at it let's do npm install cypress latest and i believe there should be like a migration guide available for me if not i can do it manually it's probably not a lot of work All right, so let's do npx cypress open once again. Let's see what happens. Migrating to Cypress 13. Yeah, let's do that. So we're going to rename the specs for me. Do that. Rename the index file for me. All right. Migrate to Cypress JSON. Yeah, this is probably just such a simple project that we don't really need to do anything manually and the migrating uh, guide will pretty much do everything that we need although it froze now so we'll see what's what's going on I see the config that that's working that's good still got the plugins there's nothing in here so we can just go ahead and delete that go to Cypress config JS we don't need this fixtures i don't think we're using but whatever e2e app.js that's cool oh good welcome to cypress all right so we got our app cy.js let's run this and let's see what happens Oh, okay, the test has passed, but the readme said this test is flaky. So sometimes it passes, sometimes it fails. And it's interesting to see... The, the, the waiting, the waiting is sort of what's, what's interesting to me. Because it sometimes does... Like it always passes right now, but it seems that maybe there's something with the with the waiting there that's going to make it fail. <laughs> I don't know. There was this really weird timeout in one of the on one of the commands. Uh, when I looked into test, the timeout was four thousand. 501 millisecond and it's exactly the thing that sort of waits uh, a little bit a little bit longer so do we actually have a solution in here maybe if I do the remove that default timeout that's going to make it flaky All right now it has failed so let's let's try to run it again Nope, still still failed. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, that so okay, my instinct was was spot on, right? So it, the 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 thing we are searching for, which is the email that we have here, the the line that appears, the 
the, the people list of people, right? That will appear just like slightly around four seconds. And that's what makes our test flaky. Because the default command timeout in Cypress is four seconds. So if this thing over here appears in four seconds or below, we're going to pass. If it's going to take longer, then it's going to fail. All right, that's a that's a nice flaky test. Uh, all right, what I'm going to do is something that I've been doing on these streams uh, recently, and I'm going to record this. And the 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 readme file specifically said, don't change anything uh, in the source directory. So I'm not going to look into there just yet. But I am going to install replay and run this test against replay uh, browser, right? So uh, those of you who are new here, npm install replay io, wait, replay io slash cypress. I'm going to install this package. And it works like any other uh, any other plugin into Cypress. What you need to do is to first of all install it, and then you can find it in the documentation. And I always go to the documentation because I never remember it, like uh, immediately. And what do we have? Do we have common JS? Yeah, common JS syntax. So I'm going to. uh copy this right so we'll import the plugin into our cypress config and then set it up in the setup node events and we have an api key which i already have stored uh in my bash profile but that's something you usually like go register to to replay io uh create your account and then in settings you'll find the find the api key Maybe I should just show it. Uh, I think that'll probably be... Wait, uh, what did I open? I wanted to open a browser, right? So if you go to app replay IO, I'm already logged in, right? So, so in the settings, you'll go here, go to API keys, and then generate a new API key. So I already have one. I saved it, saved it in my bash profile, so the plugin will be able to, to find it. Now, one more thing I need to add to e2e.js uh, this line of code. We need commands.js, so just delete that. And, and I'm good to go, right? So now when I run Cypress, you can see a change here. We have more browsers. So that's what the plugin does. It will add a new browser into your um, into your choice of browsers. We don't have the icons. I think I'm going to uh, do a pull request for the Cypress repo to to add those icons. That would be that would be nice. Anyways, uh, I don't really, I'm not really able to run uh, create a recording by just clicking on this. That's coming. That that will definitely be there. But for now, what I'm going to do is just use the headless mode. So I'll do npx Cypress run. And then I'll pass the browser. So I'm passing the options. Not sure if you can. That's better. Dash dash browser replay Chromium. So everything is pretty much going to run the same. But instead of the Chrome browser or Electron or whatever, we're going to use the replay Chromium browser. So what's that? It's a browser that has the capability to record everything uh, that's happening between the browser and operation system. What that means is that we can record everything that's happening on the test, inside the browser, and inside the application that we are running inside the browser. And that means every function call, every network call, every DOM change, uh, React elements, properties, you name it. It's all there. And it's amazing if you have a case like this, where you have a flaky test and you need to figure out why it is flaky. We already kind of figure out uh, why it is flaky, right? There is this timeout. But I want to understand why that timeout is there. So I'm going to run my test like this, uh, which means I'm recording everything that's happening in the browser. 
And now when I finish my, my test, you can see that there's a message completing some outstanding work and the recording I have just made is going to get uploaded uh, and now I can view it in Replay DevTools. Replay DevTools are just like DevTools in a, in a browser, but we have built our own and those DevTools don't debug like a live application, but can actually debug that recording. So you have like two phases, right? First, you record everything using that browser. You get a recording, which we call replay. And then you take that replay and open it in replay DevTools. So let me show you replay DevTools. I'll just, this can be open in any browser, right? So this is not a, not something uh, special. I mean, it is very special, but it's not, uh, not as if uh, you could not open it in a, in your normal browser because you can. Um, so it will take a moment to process everything, uh, the process the recording, but it's going pretty well. So not too much waiting. Let's open this and voila. This is, this is a replay, right? This is, uh, exactly what happened in our test. And we got this, uh, by default, you're going to see this viewer view, right? Where you can just go ahead and view your test, right? Here's this, uh, replay button which when i'm going to press is going to play like a video right so we can see our test in action submitting stuff blah 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 and of course it is passing so that's actually not what we want i want to run it uh more times so it uh, will eventually fail so i can sort of compare the the case where it failed and uh, with the case where it passed uh, so maybe we can keep this recording but I'm going to go back to VS Code and run this again in hopes that it will fail this time. If not, I'm going to uh, try again and again until I get a failed recording. Uh, hopefully it will not take too many times. Oh, look at the first try. Great. All right. So we have recorded the failed run, uh, completing some outstanding work and then we'll get We'll get the whole recording so let's let's go here we go here's the link go ahead and open it again we'll do some processing in the background and then open open that recording all right here we go Okay, so again, we have the viewer. We can view this as a video. Seems everything is pretty much the same, except our test will fail, right? So we didn't make it in time. The the, the message did not appear. And, uh, and this is good for us because now we can compare a passing case with a failing case. And, uh, and yeah, so I mentioned we have this viewer, right? But what we also have, and that's where the power is, we have DevTools. So in the DevTools, you can actually examine what's happening. So these look like your standard DevTools. We got console, we got elements panel, so we can actually search for elements in the DOM. We got react panel, that's useful for react application, which I don't know if this is. I think, I think it is. There was the create scripts, react, kind of script in in there right in the package JSON I believe I saw it yeah to start react script start all right that's so we have a react application and then we have the network panel so every network communication is captured here uh, and this is all of the network communication that happened during the course of our recording so as the test was running it was recording everything and we can see all of the network uh, calls being recorded, which is great. Now, let's take a look at here. So we actually have a Cypress panel. So what we can do here, we can view all of the Cypress commands. This is something we have for Cypress and we have this, a very similar thing for Playwright. Uh, 
which at the moment is not as good, but it will get there really, really soon. But right now we have this yeah list of all of the Cypress commands. And what we can do is we can jump to any of those commands and this will open this middle panel. And this is sort of like a file viewer. So if I'm well, looking at a test file, I can jump to any line of code and see what, what the code definition for that, for that test actually was. But if I want to dive a little bit deeper, I can do that because not only I have the, the Cypress test file, but I also have this source explorer that will show me all of the, uh, all of the files that the application is actually made of. Now I'm not familiar with what's happening inside this application. So I believe I need to do some digging, but this source looks like something course select. Okay. Yeah. This seems like this is the dynamic part of our, of our application. We have this index JS. We have this remote persist something. And here's a remote persist file, which seems to be the react component for whatever is happening over, over here in this application. So this is the actual code of our application. The really cool thing that might uh, be sort of uh, invisible, or maybe it, 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 you have noticed it uh, at the very beginning, is this gutter number, right? So we have our line numbers, but in this gutter, we have another number. And that actually indicates how many times a certain line of code was called in the course of this recording, right? So we have recorded our whole test run. We have interacted with an application and we have information from the application, like how many times this was, uh, this line of code was ran. Uh, so this is already pretty good information on, on what our test is doing, but we can go even deeper. We can see, uh, what was happening, what kind of data passed through that. So for example, what this test does is that it will type some name right into the input name. Let me show the viewer. Here we have the name field, right? And we will type some name inside this name field. So what I can do is go to the, go to the elements panel, try to select that some name, right? We can see it's input name, placeholder name. Uh, so I know this is like an input with the value of name, placeholder name. Do we have something else here? Pretty much nothing. Uh, so what I can do now is try to search in this remote persist component and try to see if we have that, that input field somewhere. And it seems it might be here. Oh, look here, here we have a form on submit and we have a placeholder name and the name of that I know it looks different, but this is basically a, com a field component, right? Which I believe will contain this input. This feels like a native component react. No, look, okay. This field is important from imported from the component field .js. I'll hit command P and now I can just go to that file. So let's do 08 field component JS. Okay. And here we have like all the, all the information, all the code for the, for the input field and how that actually behaves. So we have the input, we have some properties that are like passed on from the, from the parent component and we see some state, blah, blah, blah. All right. So, um, I may be going way too deep here. But I want to show you something because here we have this value, this, this state value. So this is, uh, this is something that will, uh, change as we type in to that, uh, to that component, right? As we type into that input field, the, this state value will change. So if I'm interested, I can go ahead and add this plus symbol. 
And this will tell me, like, uh, actually, let me get rid of these errors. And this will add this default date, right? right? Zero, eight, field, component, field, 35, whatever. And this will print out to the console. So adding this plus symbol with this default text is like adding a console lock to our code. But we don't actually modify the code. We're just looking at the recording, but it is interactive. So we can, we can pull the information, pull the information from how many times this line of code was called and print it out here. Now, this is not very interesting. This is pretty much 58 times the same line, right? We can change this. So this input field over here that, I that I'm typing in is like a, the, the, the brackets of a console lock, right? So I can go, hello world, which again is not that interesting. We just have 58 instances of hello world. But let's go ahead and look into this, this state value. I believe I could print that, right? This state value. And I'll type it in. And now something else will happen uh, in the console. We're printing out all of the input values of uh, all of the field components, right? So we have some name and then we have someone some oh some email dot com right so remember this field is used for both the name field and the email field right so that's why we see that twice and that's why we see that sort of printing out in this fashion where there's an empty line empty line then there's s empty line s o empty line etc etc because that's that's what's happening as we are typing. Everything is sort of refreshing. And then as we start typing the password, we see the password uh, appear. So we see like the whole life cycle of what's happening in the, uh, in this, uh, in, during this test. So Dennis, hey. <laughs> All right. I'm getting sort of sidetracked here by the different features of, uh, of replay, uh, which I'm very enthusiastic about. As you can tell, probably. Um, also, but but we we yeah we sort of strayed away of, of the real problem here, right? Uh, if we go back to our test, when we ran it, we saw that it's flaky. It's passing one time and it's failing another time. So let's now try to use these tools and try to see if we can tell what's actually different when when the test is passing and when the test is failing. So if I go to the passing test open the Cypress panel and go to the very last assertion, you can see that we get li element and then we are expecting that li element to have a certain text, right? If we go to the fail test and open the Cypress panel, we can see that the assertion is failing, but also the get input is not really returning anything, right? And we can confirm that by looking into the details so these are the details. Wait, let me. Hey, why are my details not showing? Or are they? And I'm not. Okay, it seems like this is broken for me. Oh no. Uh, okay, I had it. I had them um, resized all the way down. That's that's that was the problem. All right, so let's. Uh, okay, so when you do the details of this get command, we can see that, okay, not pretty much n nothing was found, right? Uh, it even says unable to retrieve details for this step, which is interesting. Um, if we go to the pass test and look at the details of the li over here, we can see that we have the properties. This is basically like the yielded attribute in, in Cypress. So if you click on any command in, in Cypress, and you click on the on the command, it will print out uh, information in into the console. Now in in uh, replay, we print it out over here, and you can actually click on this target element, and it will take you right to the elements panel and highlight that element in the in the DOM at that moment, right? And this is also interesting. Like this is the moment where that element was visible, right? If we scroll back and take a look at 
try to take a look at the exact element, we'll not be able to find it. Wait, where is it? Where's like even the thing, right? So we have people, we have unordered list in here, but it doesn't have any list items, any li elements. So this is where that uh, thing should render. It's not rendered yet, right? But if we go to the end of the test, uh, how far should I go? I'll probably get to the moment where that where that element is rendered. Here we go. I, I can now see that it's probably not that visible in, in the stream, but if I scroll down, look at the people. Here's our UL element and now it has LI elements. Okay, so if we're debugging the flaky test and we see that there's a discrepancy, right? We don't see the LI element here, uh, but we see it over here. Obviously, we, we want to understand what's going on with this UL element. Now, since this application is uh, written in React, our job is a little bit easier. Because what I can do in the React panel is to select this React component selector and it crashed. Oh no. <laughs> Let's see if I can do that again. Not crash, but actually... Oh, okay. Should not be happening. Uh, we should be able to like click on this icon and select a React component. It doesn't seem we can do that. I'm not sure if it's what's the cause, but the amazing engineers I work with will probably be able to tell. Um, yeah, what I wanted to see is to, uh, what I, I wanted to find that UL element and try to see like the condition uh, why it renders certain certain elements and why it doesn't. So. Probably I'll just go with search. I'll just go and search every UL element there is. And it seems that there's this remote persist, which is in the source folder. That should be uh, the thing we are searching for. Okay. So we got remote persist line 152. And we see that there's the, this map function and is rendering our li element and it says name email department course so this is probably what what we want right uh let's just i can add a print statement over here and print out all of this information let's do name email department course I'll paste it into the print statement look into the console remove this unused logs and here we go you have some name some email core did it ah shoot sorry i accidentally pressed swiped back okay the important thing here is that in this file the remote persist we have this ul thing and we have one instance of this li and this gutter number is going to tell us hey it was rendered just once let's take a look at our failed test let's open the same file so do remote persist and I'm going to what was the line again 154 so let's go to the line 154 and see if there's anything different interesting it seems to be pretty much the same we have one li element printed out uh, well it seems that this line was called once so let's print out the details and let's give it a purple color print it out in the in the console and I want to see what's happening okay so we have the same information so both the passing and failed te failing test are going to show this information actually are going to contain that information so it's not like our application is functionally broken and it, and it just breaks this information that we put into it you in our test it's probably something different. It seems to be something different because I would imagine that at some point this data could be should be like just undefined and you cannot learn anything about it. So, so this is not the thing. This, this was a red herring. We need to, we need to search for something else. So what do we search for? I don't know, actually. Um, We have this set state. Everything looks 
pretty okay here. But... And it's funny that this is... This is actually called, this is actually rendered. It's... It's, uh, it's interesting. Because we don't see that being rendered in, in our in our failing test, but we do see that in the in the passing test. Let's jump to like the exact moment when that was rendered. So I pressed command key on my keyboard. And if there were like multiple instances, we could jump into that. So when I do command or command shift, I can move backwards and forwards. So you can see that maybe in the on the line above, I can do command and take myself to the last instance of when this line of code was called or i can do command shift and it will take me back so again i'm sort of just like moving through the timeline and moving to like exact point where something of interest has happened now i'm curious if i have if this li thing was in fact rendered and i'm now pinpoint at the moment where that element should have been rendered will i see that in the elements panel Let's see, because this React component is telling me, yes, it was rendered, but will we see that in the elements panel? Let's scroll down. Here's the people. Okay, it's not. This is interesting. This is actually interesting. I thought this is going to be just like ch some cheap hack uh, with like a timeout set out, uh, set up or whatever. But it seems to be, it seems to be not even rendered here. And that's, and that's interesting. I, I like that. I like a good mystery. Mm. So we don't see that over here. It's not here. It's still in the saving mode. And if we go to the, oh, okay. Wait, that, this is interesting because we are still in the saving mode even here so i jumped into the line that's into the li line list item at the moment when it was called so i'm assuming the moment would be the same where that element would render but it seems is not the case it seems when at the moment when this li uh, line is rendered we're still showing the saving thing. So I want to take a look at this saving state, right? Because because uh, the application is going to be in saving state and then at some moment it's going to go to the saved state. So what's going to change that state? Let me search. Can I find saving here? Save status. API client doesn't seem like the thing input value saving submit oh okay so this is the this seems to be the button is this the button the saving button input value saving type submit disabled wait is that an input element this thing is input it looks like a button Let's let's see. Why is this red? What's ha what happened? Uh, let's search saving. I don't know why this is red. Let's let's refresh. I don't know what happened here. Uh, Saving. Will I find anything? Doesn't seem that way. Oh wait, this is interesting. This seems like there's. For some reason, I cannot cannot pick elements here. This seems like a like a bug, to be honest. Uh, but I don't know. Alright, so we got the people over here. Input disable submit saved. Oh wait, this is strange. Because I see the input disabled type submit value saved. 
which I guess should be this element but we see the saving over here and it says saved over here hmm. that's very strange okay I want to take a look at the status saving save status so here's what the on so there's this on form submit function and that function will will take the values of different input fields right and then uh wait where are we save da, 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 da. yeah here it is on form submit it will take the fields it will add it to the people state right and then it will set state saving and there's this api client which will take care of save people and then set state to it will clear out the the state okay and then it will save change the status to success if there's an error it will change the save status to to error so where okay let's let's take a let's add a print statement and i want to i want to take a look at this save status i'm going to give it a orange color wait save status is not defined okay maybe i need to add this over here save status Oh wait, why cannot cannot I change the save status? Hmm. I don't know. This is actually some debugging we have to do here. <laughs> On input change save status ready. This is weird, I cannot get the save status. Uh, state loading. Maybe I can add a print statement here and just print out the whole state as it goes. It's 30 lines of calls. So let's do this state. And let's see if there's anything interesting in here. All right, so there's a, so this is like a state box for everything. And here we have Okay, this actually might be interesting, right? So let's do state and... Oh, here's the save status. Okay, so now we can see the status change. So everything is ready, 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 ready. And then we get to the saving state. We re rewind that and then we go to the success state. That's showing saving, which is kind of confusing, but I guess I understand the logic here. It still doesn't really answer the question why we are stuck with this success over here. Uh, why we are stuck with this with this saving uh, state over here and and haven't really moved on to the uh, to showing the, 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 the people element. That's what that's what confuses me because we have the results of the test, right? When the test is passing, we see the li element, right? When the test is failing, we don't. So I would try. I would like to see some indication in the code for this happening. And usually, when you have like an example application, you you solve this with like adding a forced timeout, right? There's something something strange that's like um, uh, messing up messing the application, and that's what makes the the test flaky. Uh, like in real worlds, right? <laughs> your your test is flaky because the application is flaky as well. Uh, maybe this API client. I don't know. Like, cause we yeah we have this own force form submit that's going to take care of saving and changing the state. Let's look at the API client. 
Uh, maybe we'll find some answers there. So let's do client. And and ah, voila, it seems like this uh, this might be this might be our answer here because we have we have some timeouts in here that are going to yeah load people, save people. There's a local storage. Oh, interesting. So there's a so this application uses local storage to sort of fake a API communication. It will just save everything to the local storage and then print it out in the in the list of the of the people. So let's let's continue searching and comparing the passing test and the failing test. Let's go to the dev tools and I want to do the open the client JS file here as well. And in terms of lines of code being called, looks pretty much the same. So what I think might be interesting is to try to see try to see what this what this set timeout was. So it was between 3 <laughs> 3.50 and 4.50. And that's that's actually what's causing our flakiness, right? If it's between 3.50 and 4.50 that means it can either be more than four seconds or less than 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 uh, four seconds if it's less than four seconds the test is going to pass if it's more than four seconds the test is going to fail i believe we can take a look at what this function has returned right if i add this to the print statement i believe we we are capturing the value of that right yeah it seems that way let's do Let's just uh, turn off all of the the other print statements. So here's like the pause information where you have everything that you've added to the to the console. And here we have between 350 and 450, we have this. Let's add that print statement over here as well. And here we have the uh 350 so that's below four seconds so it seems to be uh exactly what we what we see in the uh in the test result right if if we have uh three and a half second test is passing therefore we have a passing test right if we have more which is right above four seconds the test is failing that's that seems to be that seems to be the case now why is it actually like showing or and not showing that element? Oh, okay, I get it now. Because the save people function that we have over here is going to return. What is it going to return? Local storage people, JSON stringify people. Okay, so it is going to add those people into the local storage, but it is going to do it a, in a interval. All right. Yeah, seems that way. Okay, and then we have the load people function. And this seems to this seems to load the information from the local storage. Interesting. I want to see where these functions are being called. Like, let's just search load people function call. It's in the remote persist. So API client load people, then people set the state. People, people. All right. So after we mount the component, that's that's when when this function is going to be called. I'm assuming. Where is that going to? What is that going to be called? Is it at the very beginning or at the very end? This is what's confusing to me. A little bit. 
Okay. Let's take a look at this function over here. <coughs> Sorry. It also seems to be called just once at this very end. Can I see the people? Is that a print statement over here? Oh, okay. This is an empty, empty array. If I add print statement here, this is also an empty array. <laughs> so I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, this component did mount. It seems to be referencing the, the like the very initial load of the component. But it, it is kind of confusing because I would expect that to be called like at, at some point at the beginning of the application. I'm not like 100% sure about this, but it seems like that. Where is that actually coming from? The component did mount. I don't see that referenced anywhere. I believe that's sort of like a React function, right? Yeah, so that's like a default. You probably don't even need to export, uh, import it. These docs are old. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. The application is slightly older. I mean, but what's old in today's world? Like we have this is application that was built like last updated three years ago and it's already old. It's already using functions that are deprecated. Isn't that crazy? Uh, yeah, okay, let's go back to this. So there was one more function in the in the client JS and that was the save people. So let's let's see where's the save people function being called. Okay, that's in the API client, right? So we save people. Let's print out people that are over here. And here we see the list. Okay. But this is the fail test. So this doesn't seem to be that different. Yeah, if I if I go to save people, find that function call uh wait where are we here and print out the, the the people yeah that's that's pretty much the same i'm, I'm still kind of curious like i see the i see the timeout that's obviously telling us something but i want to understand how the application actually works so the save people function will take those people right which are the same in passing and failing test and then returns a promise right so it will either resolve or not and it will resolve there's a set timeout function that's going to resolve in time between 350 uh, uh, 3500 milliseconds or 4500 milliseconds right so we've established that and then what's inside here we have the local storage people equals JS, JSON stringify people. So it's going to take the value passed into this save function. And that's going to save it into the local storage. And then it is going to resolve this promise with a success true. So, so far... I don't see oh okay i think i get it now like this both of these functions will eventually resolve right uh this save people will resolve and then we're going to yeah reset the state of the of the, of the inputs and and sh show the list of people but in this case we're doing it too late our test is just too fast and it's going to result as um, uh, resolve this as a failed instance way too soon. If we waited for a moment, then our test would be uh, would be uh, going well. It would be passing. 
we have the set state. Okay, I want to add this set state once more. Is there one thing I still don't quite understand? Um, in this function over here, we have this set state, and I can see that this basically oh, this clears out the fields, but people will have the value of people. All right, so as we when we save this, people will have the value of this, right? And the fields are going to be empty. If I scroll up, maybe somewhere before we save, we'll see the people is empty. All right. And the fields are filled. All right. That makes sense. As we progress through the app, the fields that we are typing in as users are going to be filled after we save that's going to basically swap and that's what the set state over here is responsible for that's what's happening here and then we save the status success and everything is done let's see what happens in the in the uh in the failing test so line 91 wait i need a remote persist file let's do remote persist line 91 and I want to print out that this state okay so at the very bottom I'll see we have people over here and then people are empty over here I mean this is kind of interesting so it seems like these two tests in in the application are not different the only thing that's really different is that is that timeout but there's still a little bit of time when that application uh while that application is still being recorded cypress won't take notice but replay will the, it will happen in the browser so there's probably like a split second while we are still recording and the test is still and the test is already done that's that's interesting i wouldn't have thought that i would honestly what really threw me off at the very beginning was that was this one, the LY. I would expect in the failing test this line not to be called even once. And it seems it is being called. It is being called at the very end. And uh, I would expect that not to be called at all in, in most of the cases. Uh, I would like to experiment with this a little bit. So now that I know that we have this uh, client over here, what if I added a more drastic timeout and I would also you know what let's add it to the const oh wait no uh, I need to do const timeout add it over here const timeout and then add that timeout and I want to console log it out console log it out oh wait I'll probably not be able to see it uh, anyways ah never mind all right I want to have like a more drastic timeout let's actually do eight between eight and ten seconds and I'll run this test. Obviously, that's going to fail. But I would like to see if that li, li, the list item element, would still render. Oh, wait. That failed way too fast. What's going on? Cannot find module URL parse. What's going on? 
Maybe I need to start the application because I made changes to that. Looks that way. Yeah, there were some errors. Let me try that again. Oh, okay. This has happened to me. Another bug report for me. Hmm, okay, interesting. Okay, never mind. Let's try that again. <laughs> okay, this has failed as we would expect. Let's take a look at the at replays who is completing some outstanding work. open that replay and now I'll just head over to the remote persist file and I want to see how many times this li key was called because in this case I would expect it to not be called at all so let's jump to the client JS Oh, wait, not client JS. It was the number 10 remote persist. If I go over here at the very bottom, li. Okay, now the line is not called because it will never render. The time is way too big. If I go to the to the client JS, try to print out the timeout. Let's print it out. By uh, these extra logs, it's eight seconds, right? Okay, so so this this was kind of confusing, but it also shows the the intensity with which replay records stuff, right? So we had a passing and a failing test, and in terms of like the code execution, like which lines of code were executed, they were sort of identical. The only difference was that we had a different. There was a timeout that was sort of messing up with our application. And that timeout was different, and that would made our test pass or fail. But in terms of the lines being executed, this li actually got rendered while our recording was still going on. So we see that over here, which is, I would say, kind of an edge case, but maybe not, I don't know. But uh, if the difference is more pronounced, you would also see that in the line execution. And this this is what was funny to me because I would expect the LI line not being executed at all in the failing test because that's what we saw in the viewer. That's what we what we witnessed. The line never appeared. Our test failed before the line could ever appear. But it seems the recording actually takes a little while longer, which uh, which uh, kind of threw me off, threw me off <laughs> in this case. But it is a really, really nice example uh, kudos to you, whoever created that. I think I saw a name, David something, or Dan, Dan G13. Very nice interview question. I, I like that very much. All right. Let's see if I can do another one. Uh, how's the chat doing? It hasn't been very active. Not sure if you're still watching or everyone left and I'm here. Just by by myself. <laughs> we got some flaky test repositories. Flaky why site. I'll just open a bunch of Air Airvet Flaky Cypress Challenge. Which would be the basic approach you would take on a case like this one? Uh, I mean, the most basic approach, I think it was in the solution, right? It was just making the timeout a little bit longer. Because that's sort of a reality of our applications, right? They sometimes take a little while to, to load. Because we have all these API calls that load assets from server and, and do all kinds of stuff, right? So that would be 
but that would be like fixing the test, right? Maybe there's a case where you actually need to fix the application and that's what, uh, that's what is really valuable with replay uh, because you can dive into the code, you have captured everything that happened on the code level, right? So if there's some flakiness, if there's something that the application is doing which is not supposed to be doing, or there's some race condition happening between your test and the application, that's where you can like really dive in and fix that. And we have been sort of fixed with this idea that end-to-end -end tests are flaky. That's no longer true. It doesn't have to be. We have the tools, we have the means of fixing our tests and our application. And I think that's really powerful. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah, another question, like whether I would try to fix the test and then go deeper to see if it's a bug on the app. Uh, as always, the answer is it depends. Uh, but what I like to do with my tests is to make them resemble the behavior of a user, right? Uh, that's not an original thought, that's tweet by Kenzie Dots. But that's, that's what I try to do with my tests. So a real user does not wait for API call to be resolved, right? They don't wait for, I don't know, um, the, the API call is kind of a good example, right? They don't know what's API, what is API calls. They just want to buy their shoes or do some action, right? Or, or book a dinner or whatever. So the test ideally should look like what the user should be doing, right? And if there's some shenanigans happening in the background of the application and it's actually making the test fail, it's probably worth considering whether the application does behave in a user-friendly way or in a way that we want it to behave. So, uh, so again, yeah, it depends. Uh, the, the, the probably the, the fastest solution sometimes might be just fix the test, maybe add a, a weight that makes the test slower, uh, but it's also not, uh, not the best solution. So I'll try to try to find a balance between fast and good. And that's kind of what we all do all the time, right? <laughs> try to balance the, the fast approach and, and, and the quick approach. Um, uh, so yeah, but ideally fix both. Um. Okay. This seems to be the same thing. Flake test challenge. Modify any files in except of drones. I, I didn't notice this thing. Forking this repo is an immediate disqualification. Why? Why would forking this repo be a disqualification? I don't get it. Oh, I guess like you don't want to, yeah, if you have a fork, you could probably find a solution and those ca candidates, a candidates could look at each other's solutions because you can see forks in the, in the GitHub. But come on, that could be... <laughs> I think that could be said, said differently, right? Like, please don't fork the repository because, yeah, other people can see, see the solution then. All right, this seems to be exactly the same thing. Maybe, maybe the forking really did <laughs> mess up uh, these people flow. Uh, all right. Okay, this seems to be have uh, a different thing. So we have a flaky visibility errors in Cypress sample project to demonstrate visibility issue when browser is not focused while running test in headed mode. Okay. npm install npm run serve you can run this wait for the test to fail i believe this might be something like a uh 
reproducible example for an issue that might be uh, as part of a, a issue report on, on Cyprus. Let me try and see just for the for the fun of it. I need to go to GitHub slash Cypress and then search in the issues for this URL. Oh look, issues, visibility errors, yeah. Just as I suspected. It's really nice if you provide a reproducible example. Uh, and this person evidently put a good, uh, a lot of thoughts and, and, and some effort into creating a reproducible example. And uh, it's good when you have that option. You don't always, right? Because it might be happening in your application, but creating a reproducible example with the same error means you need to recreate your app having the same issues. Uh, and maybe it's really hard to give that proof to someone that this is actually happening. I just cannot fix it, right? Um, and for that case, is replay is also really good. Because if you catch a bug just once, if you if you hit the record button, so I've been showing mostly the 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 flow where your tests record it, right? But you can actually go to Replay IO, download the browser, and if you open that, let me show you. Okay, let's go. Right, so when you open that, you can, oh, I have a sign in button, so I should probably sign in, but there's usually a record button. Let's let's do sign in real quick. I did sign in with Google, all right. Right, so here's this record button. You can open a new tab, hit record, and then record any kind of problem you have. And then that will create that recording, that robust recording that you can send either to the developer or maintainer of the code. The one thing that you need to look out for is that you're really recording everything. So if you if you have like a, a, like a local storage or cookies that are inside the browser, which might be sensitive, you should be aware that you're sending that too. So ideally you're working on a staging environment or somewhere where you can record and don't really have to worry about uh, that information to be exposed to someone. Uh, if you do worry about that, but you trust the person that's going to uh, be fixing that, uh, then you can go to, wait, where do I have a, uh, some sort of recording? You can go share and then share that not with anyone, but you can add a certain email and share that recording with just the person that you want. Uh, so that's also an option. And that's a, that's sort of an alternative to doing this, which is again, very awesome uh, that you put the effort to that, uh, but there's also an easier way. Just record the issue, send it over and they'll have all the information they, they could possibly need. Uh, uh, oh, good question from Dennis. As Replay.io has on roadmap supporting robot framework. Um, how do I answer this? The support for, for robot framework is practically there. Uh, so robot framework is I haven't worked with this, so I might be I might be wrong about details on this, right? But Robot Framework is a tool that helps you uh, create scenarios that are then run, um, and I believe you can choose, right, if they're going to be run uh, on top of Selenium or Playwright or whatever. In the end, what's going to happen? is that you are going to run a browser, right? And I know Robot Framework can do a lot of stuff, 
but I'm just like uh, focusing now on the things that can run in a browser, right? So we're talking web applications. I believe Rubble Framework can also do mobile apps. Not sure. We don't do mobile apps, so that's that's not a, not not an option. But for web applications, uh, if you have your Robot Framework script that's eventually going to spin up a browser and then automate that browser with certain actions, and I believe that's what what Robot Framework is doing, uh, you can use Replay. So yesterday with Nikolai and Lotkin we have done a live stream where we demonstrated how you can use Selenium with Java to create a recording with Replay. And the only thing we really needed to do is to first set up our, uh, set up our test script in a way, in the same way that it would be running a Chrome uh, DevTools, uh, Chrome DevTools, I'm uh, tripping, uh, Chrome browser, right? And when you have that set up, then uh, then all you need to do is to tell the script, hey, Chrome browser is located, the binary for Chrome browser is located at this path. And that's all you need. And you point it not to the Chrome, but you'll point it to the replay browser. So you need to download the replay browser uh, and then get the path to the binary and then you can point it to there. So. If you can do that with Robot Framework, which I believe you can, right? You can do that with anything, uh, any tool out there, I believe so, right? You can just set the binary, hey, look for browser here. That's pretty much like the, the, the option you should always have, right? So if you if you choose to, to automate Chrome, but instead set the, set the path to replay uh, browser, then you'll be able to automate that. And that means that, yeah, you can, create your tests with robot framework. And then if you encounter a flaky issue or, a, or a, some sort of problem, you can take recording from that test run and send that over to developer and they'll be able to figure out what was actually happening, what the test was trying to do. Actually, you can take that recording, add a bunch of comments to help the developer find the problem. Hey, here's where it's failing. Here's what the test was trying to do. Here's what I'm expecting and it's not there. And giving all that information, that's going to be like the best bug report you can ever create for your developer. They're going to have everything. There's like not much more information you could provide. Uh, and I think that's pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, uh, robot framework. I want to do an example at some point in the future. I might need help. <laughs> you might need uh, someone who can actually help me uh, set this up, but I have been, uh, I have been uh, poking around the idea because I, it's not the first time I hear the question whether we can, uh, we can integrate that to robot framework. And yes, you absolutely can. I just can't give you the guide yet, but I will work on it and it will eventually be out there. So maybe it can be done using browser library because this library has core in play, right? Yeah, exactly. Like you can, you can, uh, I believe that's what I said. Maybe I said it in, in some different words, but yeah, all you need to do is just swap the browsers, right? And <coughs> uh, replay browser is based off Chromium. We forked the Chromium and then add a bunch of functionality onto that. So it is capable of recording everything, right? Uh, uh, so there's no, there's no like replay Safari or replay WebKit or re replay fi Firefox. Oh, well, there actually is replay Firefox, but uh, we're kind of deprecating that, focusing on the on the replay replay Chromium. Um, the where the value is is not like on the cross browser testing, but where the value really is for for replay is to have uh, is to have a really good debugging experience, and most of the issues that happen with the uh, with the browser, uh, with, with like the test automation are some sort of timing issues where the test script doesn't really play all that well with, with the application that's under test. Uh, and, and these are the issues that are just like so easily fixed with, uh, with replay. Cause you can just pinpoint the exact moment where, uh, where the problem is. And I know that as I demonstrate this, sometimes it looks like 
lot of digging through. Uh, but uh, I hope it's not viewed as very complicated. I don't think it's that complicated. I mean, some issues can be. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but you'll still have more information in that recording than with anything else. Like, screenshot is not going to give you that information. It will give you the result, right? Uh, all right, this element should appear. It did not. But the question is why, right? And that you can only find with something so robust. Uh, uh, th that you can only find with something as robust as replay. Hey, is this live? Yeah, it is live. <laughs> if you have a question, feel free to ask, and I'll and I'll get to that. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, what's the time we have here? All right. I've been going on for almost two hours. Um. Let's let's try to see. Okay, we have the play key. Okay, so that that was the example. Probably not that play key test challenge solution. Oh, I like this. Another challenge. Wait, David Gutman, isn't that the same person we had before? I think so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is the same application over and over. Uh, but again, I really like the fact that this this is a a challenge for for a uh, for like an interview. Hey, fix a flaky test for me, will you? And if you can, I think that really shows some qualities. Just a repo set up with a bunch of flaky tests and ready to connect to Cypress dashboard. Hmm. Let's see. Create React app. Bunch of flaky tests. We got the historian here. Oops. Cypress. Oh, okay. Flaky. Well, that's not really flaky. This is it's going to fail all the time. If math random things should be visible. Uh, yeah, okay, this is <laughs> this is not really what I'm looking for. Uh, this is just like randomly failing tests. Uh, we have the... Yeah, so we have the application. And this is probably not not something we were looking for. And we got to the end of the list. <laughs> we got a flake example from Bahmatol. Delete item flake example. I believe he, he might have a video on this. Study the course. Oh, this is from his course. Let's see what we have here. Delete CYTS. Deletes the item after test. Okay. Reset the back and data by making API call. This is the application. Confirm. The application shows loaded to do items. Okay, remove every to do by clicking on destroy. One by one. Okay. This button only becomes visible on hover dust we need to force. Okay. What do we have here? Here are zero to do's. The previous test should have deleted all to do's, but accidentally it leaves on to do remaining, breaking this test. Why? Can you fix the previous test to truly clean up after itself? Ooh, okay, that's a nice challenge here. Let's try it. I'm kind of intrigued. Uh, let's clone this terminal. Git clone. Code new. Okay, let's do npm install, I believe, right? Package JSON. 
start. Put game start. Oh, we have the dev. That's nice. So the npm run dev, and that's going to open both Cypress and the application. Oh, I still have the other app running on well, default localhost. Let's just close this and open this one. Cypress version 12. That's not too bad. Open end to end testing. And here we have it. Okay, interesting. So just as Gleb has said, we have this to-do app. Does this is this like a dark pattern? Does this read my my preferences? Because I do have the dark uh, theme set up by default, but doesn't look too good on this yeah dark theme. If match media. Yeah, okay, let's let's comment this out. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's that's much better. <laughs> I couldn't really read it. That was uh not a very good dark theme. Sorry, Glip. Uh it was hard to read. Alright, so delete items after test we have this reset it should be resetting let's try to see what does it do uh, how do i yeah, that's what i want let's see what this will do it will return okay and that's okay i guess and then we'll visit the application and we have four to do's Wait, what does the test do again? Forgot. Spec. Not spec. What is it? Delete CY. Okay. So to do's and then there's like a oh okay it's this like randomly generates to do's. Reset to do's. Oh, so the reset is actually doing like seeding as well, I guess. And then we have visit and we have to do slanged okay so this can actually ge generate different number of to do's oh wait oh okay there's range so it will always create four to do's okay but it seems that after we visit we assert the length which will be four always and then we do the cleanup and select all li to do elements and then each of them is going to be wrapped and clicked on by force through so let's let's run this test and just observe the, te the test that's over here and uh interesting this seems to delete all of the all of the to do items and we got li to do destroy four that seems to be working. So what what actually fails in this next one? Has to do zero to do's. What if I do only here? Well, I to do should have length zero. Huh. Okay. If I <laughs> run it in isolation, this will pass. If I run them together, they're going to fail. Okay, let's try to see. So we got li destroy. We'll find four elements. And we'll do the first wrap, click force. Second wrap, click force. Oh, oh, I see. So there seems to be a delay between the click and the actual delete thing. So we only have three API calls here. 
but we have four to do's that we want to delete. Let's see. Let's let's do uh let's do the ugly thing first. Let's do C Y wait. And then do five seconds. Will that be enough? Yeah, it seems so. Now the test is passing. <laughs> But I'm assuming that since this is a challenge from the, I think in the readme file it was challenge from the network testing course, yeah. Then I believe the solution might be something like, let's let's first intercept the delete methods as delete to do and then I'm going to see why I get delete to do and then assert shoot have length of to do's length wait I didn't yeah I didn't map that properly doesn't seem that I guess I need to do a little bit more than just methods. So let's do delete and close the URL to do's and then something. So to do's asterisk, that should do it. Yeah, here we go. Okay. We have property length. Oh, okay. So what do we yield after we get the request oh yeah not not like that Re like this delete to do all no still nothing wait this was something else yeah okay i guess i clicked on it while it was running all right yeah so now we're waiting for four to do items uh api calls to be made we wait for them all to happen and only then we move to the next test. Really nice clip. Uh, that was a nice example. All right, sorry, I wasn't paying attention to the chat. Uh, Sandeep is saying I missed this completely. Yeah, well, we, we've been all going on for over two hours, but that's okay. We s there's still recording of this on the, on the YouTube channel. So don't worry, uh, you'll be able to see that. Do we need some sort of cleanup task or delete function? Oh, you're probably asking while I was still coding. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the, the trick was that the delete was just not happening uh, immediately. Let me see if I can find this in the, in the source code here. So we have the data index HTML. So there should be there should be delete somewhere, right? Uh, wait, what was the selector for this? Destroy, destroy. That's what we want. Destroy. And we have class to destroy, and there's a. This is in view, right? So we have the remove to do that will take care of removing that to do. So let's find this remove to do function. And here it is. It will remove. And look, here we go. We have random delay. So we added a random delay and then we have a set timeout, which is going to sort of just like take a random time to delete, uh, remove to do from the server after random delay of milliseconds. Nice. Well, that's, oh, that's actually causal log. Will we see that in causal log? Yeah, <laughs> look at that. Remove to do from the server after random milliseconds. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Very nice. All right. I think I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, I think it's about the time. Uh, I've been going on for two hours. I believe that's, that's enough for today. Uh, probably going to meet you next week. You know what? Let me check my calendar and see if that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Next week I'll be streaming again. Week after that probably as well. Then I'll have a little break 
Uh, but I have scheduled a really exciting live stream with Artem Zakarenko. I'm mispronouncing his name, sorry, Artem. Uh, he's the author of um, uh, Mock Service. Jeez, I'm really nailing it, right? <laughs> uh, MSW, that's the, the Mock Service Worker. Okay, why wasn't I s sure about this? Yeah, Mock Service Worker, a, a API mocking library for JavaScript for your application. Really powerful stuff. Uh, very respected among uh, experts in the field. I'm going to have him on. We're going to be talking about testing because he been he has been releasing a lot of great content on testing, and I want to pick his brain. Uh, he's going. He's in uh, in the. Uh, process of creating a testing course and it's going to be a really exciting one it's also going to have a chapter on debugging and we're going to be talking about debugging about different mental models that you might have uh, when you want to do debugging and different approaches and we're going to be talking about testing and all that kind of interesting stuff so uh, make sure you follow the social networks I'll definitely be uh shouting out from the rooftops when that's going to happen it's in one month uh but before we do that i'm going to be here next uh, wednesday hopefully and and then one wednesday after that so uh if you have any suggestions on what you would like to discuss what you would like to talk about maybe um you have a repository maybe you have some flaky tests uh send them to me uh over on discord or just contact me through through Twitter or LinkedIn, I'd be happy to chat. So, uh, so yeah. Oh, Sandeep has been struggling a lot with mock servers, so we'll definitely be there for that one. It will not be the very next one, but it is coming in in March, uh, and I'm really, really looking forward to that. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. Um, tune in and um, happy testing, everyone. See you next time.